All right, thank you everyone for coming to today's webinar around Safeguard Your Business, Cybersecurity and Risk Management Fundamentals for Business Leaders. Uh, this webinar is hosted by Boulay and Optimize Cyber, and we're very happy to have everyone with us today. This call will be recorded um, and you'll be able to watch it later on YouTube as well. So just by way of introduction, the presenters are Stefan Dorn. He's the CEO and Chief Hacking Officer at Optimize Cyber, a local cybersecurity firm. And then myself, Jeffrey Filler, as the partner in the Risk Advisory Group here at Boulay. Uh, so I will let Stefan take it away with his presentation and then we will open it up for questions as he goes along and we'll jump in and have him answer them as we progress here. So go ahead, Stefan. All right, thanks, Jeff. I've got my timer here to make sure I don't go too long. Um, so yeah, just real quick, a little background about me. Um, you know, born and raised in Minnesota. Uh, I've worked in IT infrastructure, in banking and manufacturing industries uh, for about a decade. Then I pivoted into consulting. Um, got a lot of experience uh, working on security strategy with folks, regulatory compliance, um, topics like that. Um, and most importantly, I come from a family of small business owners. Um, I'm really passionate about helping folks protect themselves against uh, financial fraud um, and cybersecurity risks. Um, one thing I've really realized in, in recent times is that as an industry, we really haven't uh, succeeded at moving the needle like we thought we were uh, overall with security. So today we're gonna explore that a little bit. Um, Jeff, if you wanna run to the next slide, thank you. So uh, there's kind of two problems we're going to talk about today. The first one is the industry problem. And when I say the industry, it's really the cybersecurity uh, industry on the whole. Um, the industry is largely focused on selling stuff. And there's a lot of folks out there that we've run into or, or heard uh, discussions of and things where th they're kind of diminishing the importance of some really important fundamentals uh, uh, and a focus on simplicity, which always benefits security. Um, these are often overlooked or ignored because it's not a profitable area to focus on. And they're, again, they're, they're focused on selling things largely. Um, so uh, a, a good analogy for what I mean by fundamentals would be uh, the, the airbags in your car can't be really as effective as they're designed to be if you're not wearing your seatbelt, the seatbelt being a fundamental uh, you know, control against risk in your vehicle. Uh, my airbags won't be very effective if I go flying out the window of my truck in a crash or something versus if the seatbelt does its job, the airbags can do their job. Uh, you want to jump to the next slide, please, Jeff? Yep. Thank you. Uh, then the next problem uh, is really a threat problem. So we're talking about attackers and, and different, different types of attacks that we see commonly today. Um, Again, here, over and over, we see that the majority of attackers are abusing weak fundamentals um, across, uh, you know, versus versus more advanced types of attacks. Sure, there are zero day attacks and really sophisticated threat actors out there doing all kinds of espionage and, and really high tech approaches to things. But by and large, it's attacking and exploiting weak fundamentals that attackers know are a very common place for organizations that don't have gigantic security budgets and, and gigantic training programs and things like that. Um, so we're also seeing a trend where folks are kind of ignoring uh, financial fraud related risks. Uh, we see huge amounts of money every year lost to wire and ACH fraud as an example. Basically anywhere there's payments going on and processes with that, attackers are really have weaponized that. They're good at identifying those processes, taking their time to understand how a business operates and then exploiting it and taking the money. Um, and that largely doesn't have anything to do with cybersecurity. Uh, but it does have to do with fundamental controls for risk. Um, no amount of automation or machine learning is going to help overcome those things. It's really about focusing on stopping that financial fraud. Uh, it's like, again, it's largely preventable by having the right processes and the right training in place for, for your team and your, your financial institutions. Um, you know, keep uh, back up just one real quick. Thanks. Uh, so, you know, modern attackers are really sophisticated at exploiting those weaknesses. Uh, and uh, really, you know, it doesn't need to cost money to prevent against that. It's it's an amount of knowledge, improving your processes to have extra validation steps in place and dual control over things and, and some fairly basic, you know, financial financial control concepts. Um, on this slide, we see the top two risks that we're talking about today. Wire fraud, we, we really mean financial fraud by that, but most commonly it's done by wire uh, when it's a really big impactful uh, case. Um, 
by and large, the weakness that we see there is a lack of multi-factor authentication on things like email that's facing the internet and some other basics that uh, attackers exploit. They know the processes and they can impersonate people to get that money. On the ransomware side, pretty similar story. Uh, it takes, you know, it's largely automated the way that ransomware gets in and spreads. And that does that by taking advantage again of weak fundamentals. People are missing patches. They haven't hardened systems. Uh, or they're, they're not adopting a least privilege approach, which we'll discuss a little bit later, uh, to, to prevent those kinds of attacks. Um, that results in you know, huge costs from outages and, and reputational damage and fines and everything else, uh, and sometimes paying a ransom. So um, with wire fraud prevention, uh, you know, we got three, three kind of basics for you to follow. There's, there's more to it than this, but if you get these done, you're gonna drastically reduce your risk in this area. Um, number one is, you know, uh, multi-factor authentication and conditional access controls. So that's that's some things that are email, uh, financial portals, anything like that. Your banking generally has it already. Um, but having the MFA on there, multi-factor, is hugely critical. And then exploring things like if you can do geofencing or other conditional access uh, measures to prevent oddball logins and things, you know, if you don't have staff in Germany, don't let people from Germany log into your online email or your online banking, right? S basic concepts like that. Pretty simple to establish. Um, some, some folks have a doer and a checker for any transactions over a certain threshold. A lot of times that's like $5,000. It depends on the nature of the business, right? And the frequency. But um, having those steps where somebody is building the wiring instructions, but then somebody else has to verify it and understand why are we sending this money to whomever can, can prevent those social engineering attacks from, from actually successfully taking, taking a wire and sending it internationally. Um, it's also important to work with your bank so they also have some verification steps and so that you're familiar with how your bank or your financial institution handles those transactions. Um, and also so that you can under you can factor that in with your risk management, right? If you know they have a process and they've documented with you, but they have a process to verify it, and then if they don't follow it, that might not end up being your problem in the long run if it's a bunch of money involved. So it, it's a good way to, to cover yourself and, and to just educate yourself on how everything's going to flow with your transactions. Um, one last tip is uh, try to use strategies to minimize information sharing of sensitive account numbers, routing numbers, things like that. Um, most banks will allow you to set up a credit only uh, account to receive payments from. And so if you're sending invoices all over the place by email or whatever, um, credit only accounts don't really matter as much if an attacker gets knowledge of that account number, right? They're not going to be able to pull money out of it nearly as easily uh, as with just a, a bi-directional account. Um, the next slide, uh, we're going to talk about uh, the ransomware side of things. Um, again, strong fundamentals are the best protection here. It also uh, has to do with getting cyber risk insurance, which uh, if you feel that your company's at risk from a ransomware attack and that that could be a devastating thing, a lot of times, even if you do everything right, you still may need to lean on an, ins an insurance policy to cover um, setting up a temporary call center to respond to 10,000 clients calling your call center all at once about the, a data breach that you had to report or uh, dealing with the investigation and the recovery and the, and the incident response costs and things like that. It's, it's always situational and contextual to everybody's business, but having your fundamentals in place enables you to consider getting that cyber risk insurance. Um, without those, the, the way the, insur the insurance industry is trending, you're going to have a real hard time getting coverage, uh, or at least at a fair price. Um, another tip there is to do, do as much as you can with what you already have. Most people look to purchase a solution, which sometimes that's what you need to do. But a lot of times we have the technology on hand and it's just not configured all the way. We haven't kind of read the manual fully to understand what we need to do to enable some better controls to prevent these things from spreading as easily and to limit access, um, which kind of the, the last part here is, is really, um, Least privilege is a, is a fundamental that people need to understand and, and really follow. Don't just put, you know, don't give everybody full blast access to their machine or your network if you don't have to, because when attackers compromise that person or that machine, they have that equivalent access to your organization now. So the more you limit that, the more you limit the scope of a successful attack. And we know people are fallible and that machines aren't perfect either. And zero days come out all the time. So knowing we can be attacked, we want to limit the extent of the damage that can happen in a reasonable amount of time. Um, can we go to the next slide, please, Jeff? 
So one of the fundamental controls, this is kind of the, the cornerstone of everything we talk about uh, with Optimized Cyber. And it is something that there's a lot of companies out there selling MFA solutions that work fantastically. A lot of other folks are kind of but more focused on endpoint protection and, and other really important facets too. But without this piece, uh, attackers are so good at attacking companies that don't have these basic controls in place that they the, the other stuff doesn't even matter because they don't need to exploit any of that to get around your security. They can just log in as your employee and impersonate them. Uh, it's very successful when it does when it's possible. So uh, multi-factor removes uh, the importance of passwords largely. So if your your employees tend to use the same password across multiple accounts or third-party services, things like that. Well, if you have multi-factor on all your stuff, if there's a breach on that other stuff, third-party stuff, it doesn't matter nearly as much that they used a really familiar password for both because the attacker would still have to get through the multi-factor to get access to your systems. Um, on the flip side, you know, coverage is the other important part. Uh, a lot of companies we see have multi-factor for a set of employees, but maybe there's 10 IT people, or I don't want to pick on IT people necessarily, but there's always some exceptions that are made or an executive has access. Well, attackers know that. So that's who they target first and they have the best chance of success. So making sure you have really good coverage with your controls is also really important. It's like wearing, you know, four people in the car, but three are wearing seatbelts, right? Not a great situation. Um, thank you. I was just going to ask for that. Uh, and then, you know, these are the rest of the, the fundamentals, kind of the cornerstone things. These are also, uh, coincidentally, some things that the insurance industry is very focused on with, with evaluating how people are doing with it before they're going to give you cyber risk insurance coverage. Um, so endpoint detection and response. I'm going to go through these super quick. This is more as a reference for folks, but endpoint protection, that's classically, that's your antivirus, right? These days, they got a million different ways to slice it, but it's to, to catch intrusions of different natures on your system and report that back and hopefully contain it. Um, monitoring, logging, and alerting, that one's kind of straightforward. Um, most people don't really have that uh, handled as well as they should because that's really valuable for investigations and recovery um, and determining the extent of how bad a compromise was. And if you're forced to report that kind of stuff, which more and more people are, uh, that becomes a really big concern. And it's way cheaper to look it up in logs than to do a bunch of forensic disk analysis to pull out what exactly did the attackers touch. Uh, incident management and planning, that's just having a plan ahead of, you know, uh, the expensive way to do incident response is to pull your dusty binder off the shelf with your plan from five years ago in it versus rehearsing it once a year, making sure it's fresh and that you have the right contact info and, and things like that so that when it's go time, you're not wasting valuable minutes uh, figuring out what you're supposed to be doing. Um, offline immutable backups, same thing there, uh, hugely important for ransomware recovery and, and other types of incidents like that. Um, but if you don't want to have to consider paying a ransom to, to the bad guys, having really bulletproof backups is a great solution. And incidentally, you need that for disaster recovery and business continuity in the first place. So everybody runs on technology, so you need to have a really solid backup strategy. Um, access management, uh, I won't harp on least privilege more, but it's really limiting people's access to systems and data to just what they need to do the job and uh, and trying to keep it at that as best as possible. Security awareness training, again, everybody's fallible. Everybody can be social engineered and people get busy. Um, attackers know to prey on businesses at specific times of the year when they know they're going to be swamped with work, tax season, end of month, things like that. So having that training to just have people help people recognize potential attacks and to report them up the chain and not feel like they're going to get in trouble for reporting too much and things like that can really help uh, bolster your security culture at an organization. Uh, financial risk controls, we kind of already covered those, but they're super important and often not, not known about or covered. Um, and then some of the other basics, vulnerability management would be patching, uh, hardening, and, and keeping on top of that kind of stuff, um, and using vulnerability scanners to help establish a hardened baseline for your systems. Uh, and then vendor management is third-party service provider oversight, right? Making sure that who you work with, critical providers to your organization, aren't creating a risk along the way, um, a supply chain risk, or if they have, if it's a managed service provider or something like that, and they have tons of access to your network and systems, you want to make sure that they're also following some due diligence and, and some good risk management principles so they don't present another risk to your organization. All right. And uh, this is kind of my, my conclusion slide. It's, it's, it's really all about the fundamentals. I know I've said that 10 times at least, but that's the point. 
Um, it's, it's also what we tend to overlook, looking at fancier solutions to try to solve our problem. Um, do more with what you have already. It's, it is generally possible and generally not addressed. Um, or if you don't know how to do it, find a professional that does and they can get it dialed in. A lot of these, a lot of these things are kind of set and forget um, configurations that maybe don't take a ton of time, but it took a lot of knowledge to know how to do it and, and how to do it right for a particular organization. Um, addressing those non-technology risks with layers of process to catch errors or, or to validate process or to validate transactions, and prevent fraud. Um, and then that just comes to basic risk management principles again. Um, so lastly, look to professionals if you need a hand. Uh, I tell my counterpart all the time that I don't do my own plumbing. It's a disaster if I attempt it. I don't have the specialized knowledge to do well at it. So I get a professional to help me. And it's uh, generally ends up being the best way to, to get the job done right. Um, you know, there's many people in this in this area that are new, new to security, new to learning about it. it. It's kind of a big, complex thing, and we haven't addressed it well. Um, so it's really smart to seek guidance and coaching so that you can protect your business against uh, these, these pretty significant threats um, with strategies that are going to be tailored to your organization and your people, not just a one-size-fits-all thing off a shelf. Um, and with that, uh, Jeff, I'll hand it over to you. All right. Thanks, Stefan. Appreciate all that. Um, so you. as a segue, I'm going to kind of talk about the SOC 2 uh, report, uh, why it's important, and how it uh, impacts um, cybersecurity as well. Um, and so just kind of giving a high level overview, again, we'll just talk about what it is, who needs one, um, how you scope out what your SOC 2 report is going to cover, uh, how you prepare for a SOC 2 examination, again, the cybersecurity considerations to think about, and then the ongoing renewal process of enhancing and renewing your SOC 2 report, um, ideally on an annual basis. And so as we, um, as we go along, um, feel free to ask questions and we will get, them, get to them at the end here. So SOC 2 report, what is it? Basically a SOC 2 is a framework that was des designed by the American Institute of Certified Public Accountants that covers five trust services criteria related to security, availability, processing integrity, confidentiality, and privacy. Uh, who needs a SOC 2 report? These are basically service organizations that are required by their customers to demonstrate a certain level of security, uh, security compliance, as well um, as any other contractual commitments that they're making to demonstrate that they are, um, that they are achieving those commitments uh, by a third party attestation. So the types of industries that usually benefit from a SOC 2 are software as a service organizations, um, IT managed service providers and data centers, as Stefan mentioned, vendor management, um, payment processors, and any other companies who collect or process sensitive information might find themselves being asked to, to show a SOC 2 report as a condition of a customer doing business with them. So of the five criteria, security is the only required one that you have to embark on. Uh, the other four are optional, but can help strengthen the SOC 2 report if you choose to uh, go into those. And you may find that customers will also want to get assurance around the availability of your system to make sure it's performing well, that it can be relied upon from an uptime standpoint. So if you do have any contractual commitments related to uptime, um, then I would certainly recommend doing the availability section as well. But the only one that's required um, at a minimum is the security component. Uh, there are two types of SOC 2 reports. Uh, the first is a type 1, which is essentially a limited uh, examination that only focuses on the suitability of the design of controls as of a point in time. So generally, as of a month end, do you have the right controls in place to achieve your service commitments and system requirements? Uh, the type two is more so what, uh, what the public wants to see over the long term, and that's a suitability of design and operating effectiveness of the controls over a period of time. And generally, this is a period of three to 12 months. Um, we recommend doing an annual examination once a year, but it's understandable how in the first 
the first time through it, you may want to do a shortened period just to get a type two report out sooner. Uh, but those are the two types of SOC two reports. Again, with the type two being the one that you're going to be renewing on an annual basis, providing a higher level of assurance, and a type one as being more of that stepping stone, getting the suitability of the design of controls confirmed before moving on to, to the type two. So as we discuss what level of assurance do customers want to see, uh, SOC 2 Type 2 is ultimately your destination, but a Type 1 can be accepted in the interim as a stepping stone. And then again, the other four criteria are optional outside of security, but if your customers are seeking assurance regarding availability, processing integrity, confidentiality, and privacy, then you might want to consider adding those into the scope. And here are some examples of the type of assurance that would be provided by choosing those uh, categories. So again, availability, we'll talk about persistent performance and reliability, processing integrity, that's one if your systems, uh, if it generates certain reports or outputs that customers want to be relying upon for accuracy and integrity, then that would be an important category as well. Confidentiality is a small section, just basically around protection of customer confidential information, how you safeguard and dispose of co co confidential customer data. So for example, if in your contracts, you are committing to disposing of customer data within 30 days upon subscription termination, then that would be something that we would test in the confidentiality section. And then privacy is probably the largest section outside of security, and that relates to privacy practices and protection of personal information and data subject rights. So if you find yourself collecting and processing personal information, then that might be a section that you want to include as well. So the process for preparing for a SOC 2 essentially goes into three different steps. The first step is a pre-audit readiness assessment, which is where we will first understand your business, uh, this, the relevant system that you're providing to customers, and then just discuss expectations of what would be um, required typically in a, in a SOC 2 examination. And we'll talk to you about what controls you currently have in place and then work with you to determine what gaps, uh, if any, exist that will impact the report um, when it comes time to do the actual examination. Um, and so during that readiness assessment phase, it's important that be done prior to entering a type one examination or type two observation period, because if we do identify any gaps that would impact the report, you're going to want to address those before going into the audit period. So then the next step, again, it's not required to do a type one, but we certainly recommend it. Um, and that's going to examine the design of controls as of a point in time. And you'll be able to provide a report to your customers indicating that you've met uh, at least that aspect of the SOC 2. And then moving into the type two observation period, which will generally run three to 12 months the first time. And then annually, we would recommend just to do a continuous 12 month uh, examination so that it's only being done once a year. So the scope of the security category includes a number of different sections. Um, this doesn't represent all of them, but these are the ones that pertain mainly to cybersecurity. So section six, which is the logical and physical access controls tends to be one of the larger individual sections. Um, that's where we're going to look at identity and access management, physical security. Um, we're going to be looking at intrusion prevention detection systems, antivirus, all, a number of different cybersecurity considerations will be encompassed within this section. System operations, uh, a big emphasis here is incident response. So, you know, as Stefan mentioned, you know, we can all suffer data breaches and it's really important to have a robust incident response program so that you can min minimize the damage in the event of an incident and so if there are any incidents that take place during the type 2 observation period within that section we will test did you follow your incident response plan to contain the damage and recover your systems in a timely manner and conduct any other investigations or post-mortem analysis to ensure that such incidents don't take place um, again in the future. Change management, uh, 
most of our clients being SaaS companies, this pertains mainly to the software development process, but it can also encompass other system changes, uh, hardware, infrastructure, all of that also follows through a robust change management policy. And then risk mitigation, as Stefan alluded to, the cyber insurance is something we would look for there. Um, you know, because again, anyone is vulnerable, but also looking at the business continuity disaster recovery plan, uh, any tabletop exercises that you do around that, and then vendor management is also a key piece within the risk mitigation section. So last slide here around um, what happens after you achieve SOC 2 compliance. Um, as you know, that it's not going to last forever because it is as of a point in time for a type 1 or a period for type 2. Uh, so generally, the SOC 2 reports are good for about 12 months. After 12 months, they generally become you know, old and outdated, and that's why renewing it annually is important. Um, but it's also important for your own business and making sure that you're continuing to evolve and strengthen your information security program over time. So a SOC 2 report is not meant to be you know, stagnant do the same thing every year. You know, an auditor should also always monitor for any changes to the system and should be recommending opportunities for you to enhance and strengthen your internal controls over time so that you're, as you grow, you continue to have a stronger uh, information security and risk management program. And so with that, uh, we would be happy to open it up for questions. Looks like we've got a little less than 20 minutes. And so we do have one question here. I believe this is for Stefan. Uh, Chad is saying that we host our email internally and have deployed the additional SPF, DKIM, and DMARC, not MFA. How is MFA deployed on email access when email is going to employ phones and Microsoft Outlook as we use email for professional business communications, which are not financial or confidential? And what is the danger we are trying to prevent? Any thoughts, Stefan? Yeah, that's a great question. And it sounds like, uh, Chad, you have some great controls in place already uh, on the email side. So that's really good to hear. Um, I, I typed up a response too in, in preparation. So I'll put that in the chat, but I'll talk about it first. Um, number one, if you're using uh, like Exchange Online for your email or, or anything like that, a, a hosted solution, usually it's just a matter of switching MFA on, right? And then training users. Um, what that'll do is require users um, anom anomalous logins or logins from new systems or a new web browser or things like that, or maybe after a timeout of 30 or 90 days, they'll get a prompt to do multi-factor authentication again. It's generally not set up these days to require every single time, unless there's enough risk there that that is a requirement. Um, you know, maybe a financial institution would require that versus uh, a, a, different, a different type of sales organization or something like that. Um, on top of that, to keep my answer sort of succinct, uh, you, you know, if you're hosting your own email, you may need to look at a third party solution for a multi factor, um, but you can usually also tie a, a hosted, you know, exchange server or something like that into Microsoft's cloud and use Azure MFA or something of that nature. Um, and then to, to speak to the risks. Uh, so I've, I've done a lot of the attacker side with offensive security and things like that uh, in my career. And so you, you may not think that most people have much sensitive information in their, in their work email, um, but they probably do, even if it's not sensitive to your business. It may be personal in nature, uh, correspondence. Um, really, what, what you'll see attackers uh, kind of go after is they may use a compromised account uh, from your organization to perform spear phishing attacks or other uh, you know, impersonation attacks on other employees or even your clients. Uh, you know, if I get into somebody's mailbox, I also get their whole list of contacts and possibly your global address list for the organization. Now I have a whole bunch of targets, right, as an attacker. Um, that also will use a compromised email account to abuse things like a password reset function for a different account we're trying to access, um, you know, things of that nature. Cool. Uh, yeah, Chad has a follow up uh, there. <laughs> I just saw that. Yep. Yeah. It, generally, in my experience, the way I've generally advised people to set it up, unless they have a requirement to that every single time you got to go through the process, it's it's much less painful than it used to be back in the the early days of MFA. Um, often, your experience will be if if your users are using the same phone, the same workstation, or whatever to access those systems, unless they're traveling or something like that they're rarely going to see that prompt. Maybe every every month, you can you can usually set the threshold that it'll kind of expire that MFA approval. 
um, for the systems that it trusts, but it's all it's all kind of a risk based approach that that these multi factor systems will will incorporate um, to determine if it's a risky login or not. Cool. cool. I'll, I'll post my first answer in there just so people have it written. <laughs> Another follow up. <laughs> yep. Yeah. For a new device, that'll usually trigger a login um, uh, in, in most schemes for authentication these days. All right. Uh, any other questions for Stefan or myself regarding cybersecurity and SOC 2 compliance? All right. If not, we will be happy to give you guys some time back. Again, thanks for joining us today. And uh, if you have any other questions, do feel free to reach out to us uh, at those addresses there. And we would be happy to get in touch and, and speak more about uh, kind of what we do and how we might be able to help. Thanks for your time, everybody. Thank you.